My name is Paul Williams. I'm a pharmacist with uh, Waukesha Memorial Hospital. I primarily work in the ER. Today what I'm going to do is I'm going to be talking today a little bit about pharmacology. Just kind of giving you some basics about pharmacology and then I'm going to grow on some of those basics. I'm going to tell you a little bit of how they apply and uh, make sure you pay attention. There's a couple multiple choice questions at the end, okay? Um, I didn't put the answers on your sheet, but I got them on my PowerPoint. All right? So um, my lecture style is uh, pretty much open. So if I'm talking and I'm not making any sense, uh, stop me, raise your hand, flag me down, however you want to do it. Um, but uh, let me know what questions that you have, and uh, we can get those answered right away and start moving forward, okay? <coughs> so a little bit about my objectives today. Uh, like I said before, I just want to give you an overview of pharmacology. I want to give you some basic definitions about uh, bioavailability, what it, what it is, half-life, parental versus enteral um, drug delivery, and then a little bit about uh, some basic pharmacology about antihistamines, the role of antihistamines, um, the differences between those and uh, H2 blockers or histamine 2 blockers, and then we'll sort of move on to uh, other medication classes during the next lecture. So, a question for you. What are drugs? Seems like it's a pretty easy question, right? What is a drug? Well, it's basically it's any drug or material which has been ingested, injected, absorbed into the body that's used for the diagnosis, the treatment, or the, cu or the cure of disease conditions, okay? I'm giving you an example up here of something that you're very familiar with as naloxone. So if I give you the definition of a drug and I say it's, it's for the diagnosis, the treatment, or the cure of disease, naloxone in this situation can be used for both. So you're giving naloxone for a person that's maybe um, apneic, that's not breathing in the scene, okay? You don't know what they ingested. Using it maybe to reverse the apnea, hopefully, okay? But maybe you're also using it for a diagnostic test too, all right? So what sort of medications does naloxone reverse? Opiates, all right? So if you have someone that's not breathing, that's not responding, you give them naloxone, okay? It's going to help them breathe. It's going to reverse, for, so it's for their treatment of apnea, okay, and unresponsiveness. But it also can be used for maybe a diagnostic test, too. So you have this person that's unresponsive, that's not breathing. You give them Narcan and it reverses them. Well, that tells you that what? They took too much opiates, maybe. Maybe they overdosed on opiates, one or the other, okay? If you give naloxone to me up here right now, it's not going to do anything. I don't have any opiates on board. It's not going to change my breathing drive, respiratory drive. It's not going to change uh, how responsive I am, okay? So there's a lot of money and there's a lot of time that goes into the process of drug development, okay? To, to get a drug like naloxone out there or to get a other new breaking medication out there, it takes a lot of uh, uh, time and effort by uh, drug manufacturers, okay? When they do a lot of the effort that goes into drug manufacturing, a lot of it is done uh, behind the scenes. Clinical trials are behind the scenes, and when they bring the drug to the forefront, they go to the FDA and they say, hey, I want to patent this drug. It's used for the treatment of uh, cancer, okay? At that particular time, uh, the drug manufacturer submits uh, a new drug application. Uh, they also submit information about what they want the brand name being called. At that point in time, they also submit information about what the generic is called, okay? If that drug is approved, it is pushed forth uh, into uh, drug delivery, and that, now, that medication is now available for the general uh, uh, public. And if it's a, a prescribed medication, it's available for per, uh, physicians to prescribe. So each specific drug has not only a brand name, but a generic name too. 
So atomidate, amidate is the brand name. Uh, you'll see uh, just on the specific brand named products that are out there, you'll see them listed both as a brand and a generic. Okay. Now if we talk specifically about whether something is supposed to be capitalized or not capitalized, uh, for the most part, the brand names are always capitalized, like Vicodin, the V is always capitalized, Norco, the N is always capitalized. The generic names, for the most part, are the lowercase names. So even though it's here, it's atomidated, it's capital E, it's because it's the beginning of like a sentence or a phrase. Uh, normally that would be a, a lowercase e if you're going to be using it in a, in a paragraph or in a sentence. The rest of the vials here, uh, they all contain generic manufacturing or generic names only, so furosemide, you won't see Lasix because it's a generic available, metoprolol, um, diltiazem, brand name is cardizem, you won't see cardizem uh, listed there. So with the development of medication and uh, the testing of medication, both the brand and the generic, um, not only do the brand names have to go through a very rigorous clinical trials to prove that their safety and their efficacy is there for the treatment of certain medications and disease states, but the generics also have to go through a very rigorous uh, clinical trials and they have to be rated as equal to the brand names. So you ask, how do they do that? Does anyone know? So um, all the generics, like whenever a specific manufacturer makes a generic, and there's, there's multiple different generic manufacturers that are out there, they take the, the brand name product and they match it up against the generic. And they compare absorption of the medication. They compare uh, peak uh, concentrations. And then they also compare uh, durations of uh, effectiveness. And all those things have to equal uh, pretty much the same thing for the generic manufacturer uh, to say that their drug is, is equal to the brand name product out there. And they give them different ratings. Uh, um, kind of like the Better Bu Business Bureau where you have a triple A rating, which means that you're a good business. Well, for generic manufacturers um, to be equal to brand name manufacturers, they have to have an AB rating, okay? And all the pharmacist does to make sure that the, the generic is equal to the brand name, um, they have a list of medications uh, from the FDA, and this is a published list of medications in a book, and we reference that list all the time. Okay, um, a lot of times um, over-the-counter medications uh, don't always get compared to brand name medications, okay? Because what happens with uh, uh, physicians is physicians write for a brand name like, like Advil, okay? Um, they'll write Advil, 800 milligrams, one tablet three times a day as needed for pain, okay? Now the pharmacy gets that prescription and they say, okay, brand name Advil, uh, 800 milligrams, we don't have that product, okay? But we've got a whole shelf full of generic manufacturers, okay? Those generic manufacturers that submitted uh, uh, an AB rating or a rating to the FDA and the FDA has approved it, all right? Now for over-the-counter things, it's a little bit different. So over-the-counter things are as good as a brand name, but you won't see, um, uh, labels say generic Advil, okay? But you won't see prescribers writing for 200 milligrams of over-the-counter Advil either, all right? Um, a lot of times the uh, over-the-counter things are available by the generic name itself, which is ibuprofen. Uh, most people are familiar with uh, um, that medication, um, but they don't have to be necessarily rated as the same as, uh, as a brand-named product like Advil. Yeah, so uh, there's sort of, there's two classifications of medications, and there's either prescription medications or non-prescription medications. So if we talk about uh, non-prescription medications, um, usually non-prescription medications get released after a prescription has been around for a while. So uh, specifically, Prilosec has been probably available for uh, 10, 12, maybe 13 years before the over-the-counter version of Prilosec was available. So a lot of the, um, the, the efficacy of, so I say efficacy is how well the drug actually works to control um, acid reflux and uh, gastric pH.
Okay, that's what Prilosec is for. It's, it's to increase the pH of the stomach, okay? Provide a less acidic environment, all right? So a lot of the efficacy that the drug was there for was provided before the medication actually went generic. The safety was there during the clinical trials before the drug was F actually FDA approved, but um, there's different phases of uh, data collection for these new drug um, and the new drug manufacturers also. So some of the data collection was done actually after the medication was released uh, uh, to the public. And when I say to the public, the, the drug was available by only prescription, but the FDA was still gathering uh, safety data. So this is important because uh, even though I'm talking about new drugs, sometimes a drug actually reaches the market, is approved, uh, physicians start prescribing the medication, and then later on, uh, there becomes a safety issue, okay? Maybe the drug is uh, what we call tratogenistic, so it's, uh, it's, it's harmful to maybe newborn, or before babies are born, all right? Or maybe it uh, has some uh, underlying issues with uh, cancer. Uh, a drug called uh, Avandia or, or Actos actually increases your risk of bladder cancer, all right? That drug's been around for 15 years, and they didn't know about it uh, within the first clinical trials. It takes a, a many, many years of repetitive exposure to the medication to actually, you know, cause uh, the cells in the body to turn over and become uh, uh, cancer cells, okay? So now that drug is somewhat removed from the market. And I'll be talking a little bit more about some more drugs that have been uh, one particular one that's been removed from the market because of safety issues. So a little bit about, you know, uh, the difference between uh, uh, prescription versus uh, something that's over the counter. So um, a specific, there's two classes of medications and I'll, I'll say there's prescription and there's non-prescription. So uh, the non-prescription medication, one example would be a Prilosec uh, 20 milligram tablet that's available over the counter. A prescription strength product would be the Prilosec that would be 40 milligrams, okay? Um, the FDA usually, like I said, approves these medications after the safety has already been established, um, but maybe the, the safety hasn't been established in higher doses. And that same thing goes with uh, uh, Pepsid or Famotidine, uh, something that you can get prescribed to you as a stronger strength dosage, 40 milligrams, uh, lesser strength, either a 10 or a 20 milligrams is available over the counter, okay? So, the FDA also recognizes that uh, with higher strengths of medication and you being on a medication for a chronic period of time, the more monitoring that has to be done. And so if you're going to be taking a medication over the counter, we can't monitor that as healthcare providers, all right? But if we write you a prescription for one and we say, take this once a day for 30 days with no refills, and then you run out of refills, you have to come back to us and we have to monitor you to say, is it getting better? Is your gastric ulcer healing? Are you still showing those signs and symptoms? Are you still passing blood in your stool? Um, you know, or are you having some really bad side effects of the medication? Are you, are you, you know, is your white blood cell count dropping because of this medication? We draw a blood test, we figure it out, okay? So that sort of categorizes why certain medications are available by prescription, because as healthcare providers, we need to monitor you for specific side effects of medications, but we also need to monitor to make sure you're getting better with that medication versus something that's available over the counter. All right? So <clears throat> I also understand that um, I need to know a lot of the abbreviations when it comes to prescriptions, when it comes to uh, prescribing a certain medication, you know, for Q-Day, does that mean every day? Uh, BID, that means twice a day. PO, that means orally, IV. As paramedics and as advanced uh, transport uh, paramedics, you need to know a little bit about what the abbreviations are, okay? Now, if I talked to you 10 years ago, you really needed to memorize all the abbreviations, what they were, uh, what they meant, because you were basically reading a chart and photocopies of a chart that were all abbreviations, right? Now with the electronic age, a lot of this is all typed out for you, written out for you. But there's still some facilities that still use um, older abbreviations, and so you'll still need to figure out uh, what some specific abbreviations are 
to really help you practice. All right. So one of the most important things, and uh, I know that we're talking about uh, advanced care transport, uh, specifically maybe from one facility to another one, and we really don't worry too much about medication lists. And medication lists are, you know, is if you go in and pick up a patient from the home, you understand that you need to grab all their medications, whether those are medications in kitchen cabinets, medications in the bathroom. Look for a list that's on, you know, hanging on the fridge. If they have a list on the fridge, you need to grab that. But also you need to, uh, to understand that you need a list of what their home medications are if you're going to be doing advanced transport too. All right. Some of these facilities, you're going to be transporting them and the patient's only been at the facility for two or three hours. Well, maybe they just went far enough that they got a list for you, uh, but they didn't go any, any further than that. So maybe the patient's actually having some sort of drug interaction that you don't know about, uh, but you're, you're smart enough that you took this class that you would know to get a list of their medications uh, and relay that on to the next provider. Okay. Does that make sense for you? Good. I talked a little bit about the differences in between prescription and over-the-counter medications. Um, one another example that I'm giving here in this, uh, uh, on this slide is the differences in between the doses of ibuprofen. So ibuprofen, 400 milligrams, 600 milligrams, 800 milligrams, those are available by prescription only. 200 milligrams um, is available over the counter. It doesn't mean that the 200 milligram dose is ineffective. Okay? It just means that there's a, a, a very large uh, therapeutic window for this specific medication. Okay. Now the 200 milligrams might be a lower dose, um, but it still is effective uh, for treating pain and uh, aches and then fever also. So with advanced care transport, I hope that you'll have uh, um, access to drug information, either books or, books or electronic devices that you can look up medication on. Okay. It's important for you to know uh, what medications are out there, how they're used, doses that are appropriate, and also what to monitor for side effects, all right? Now, I just flashed up, this is a, a specific reference uh, that references a drug called Manitol, all right? So you can see from this uh, particular slide that uh, the mechanism of action actually uh, is an osmotic diuretic, okay? So it's a, a diuretic in nature, but it's a little bit different than other diuretics that are out there. Manitol is only available as an IV product. It's not available as an oral product. Okay. Now, what I want to emphasize is that um, not only will you have these devices and you'll have books available for you for drug information, but you really need to become familiar with how to use it, where to look for the medication, and hopefully you won't rely on them too much uh, because a lot of that medication uh, and information about medication should be somewhat active in your, in your mind when you're, when you're thinking about transporting a patient from one institution to another one. But there's little uh, snippets that you might not remember from one drug to another drug, and specifically the mannitol, and why I brought this up is because when infusing mannitol, you need to use an inline filter, all right? And that's an inline filter um, whenever, you're, whenever you're giving it. So mannitol is a very um, uh, tricky medication because when you change it from uh, temperature wise, it tends to crystallize out, okay? When I was going through organic chemistry and I was uh, studying drugs and I was growing crystals out of medications and stuff like that, it was very interesting to me because um, you're, you're changing from one uh, specific uh, physical state, which was a liquid, and then you're changing it into another physical state, which is a solid. Mannitol is interesting because you can take that same uh, physical state, say it's in a liquid, it's in an IV bag, and you're running it on a patient, all right? And mannitol is a, one of these drugs that's specifically used for uh, short-term use for diuresis. It causes a, a decrease in intraocular pressure, but it also causes a decrease in intracranial pressure too. So you think about patients who are having a head bleed, all right, where they're uh, totally becoming confused. You can decrease their uh, intracranial pressure a lot by giving mannitol and it works fairly quick, all right? Causes a diuresis, so that water is shifting from the blood out into the urine, all this fluid is shifting, but then it's also causing a shift off 
off of the uh, uh, CNS too. So all that extra fluid that's building up in the head, uh, some of that diuresis is crossing over into the blood and it's causing a, a diuresis out in your, uh, via your kidneys, into your urethra and out your urine. So back to the point of knowing your drug references, um, this specific drug you need an inline filter for. Um, the physical uh, uh, chemistry of the medication changes. It goes from a liquid to a crystal very, very rapidly, especially if you change uh, temperatures. So if you're transporting a patient out of um, the ER and the ER temperature is uh, 70 degrees, well, great. The medication is in its uh, liquid form at that specific state, all right? You transport out the ambulance bay and it drops 10 degrees, and now it's 60 degrees. That specific medication can change from a liquid into a crystal and it'll cloud on you immediately, all right? So you don't want any medication to be uh, infusing onto a patient that's in its crystal form, all right? It can cause increased clots. It can cause a lot of uh, painful IV infu in infusion but also the medication is not going to be delivered if it's in a solid form, okay? So the filter is there to uh, protect the patient to make sure that they don't get any solid forms of the medication too. So back to drug references, um, you need to be familiar with what references are out there, but you also need to be familiar with how to use your references, okay? If you heavily rely on your references for all your um, information, things can change very, very rapidly and you'll be looking through your drug reference to say, okay, this one needs an inline filter, or, or this is a side effect of this medication. So some of these things I'm gonna be pointing out, these are the most important things, and these are the things that come up all the time with medication. Um, and some of the little smaller things I'll, I'll point out in detail, and uh, there are things for you to be available to look up on a regular basis. All right, control substances. So um, a lot about this slide is, is to differentiate between um, uh, narcotics and other controlled substances. A lot of times uh, you'll be referring to uh, medication as a, a narcotic and you think narcotics um, are um, pretty much all controlled substances and I want to differentiate that from right from the start. Okay? When I say narcotics, um, they actually are um, derived from uh, opiates. So opiates... I'll use that interchangeably, interchangeably with opioids. Uh, some people differentiate those, but I think now in um, modern healthcare, I think pretty much people use those interchangeably from one to another one. Uh, marijuana, cocaine, uh, these are not uh, narcotics. These are different classes of medications. Um, heroin would be an example of a, 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 a narcotic, which is an opioid. Um, Hydrocodone, hydromorphone, morphine, these are all examples of uh, narcotics that are opioids, okay? So a little bit difference between those, and I'll sort of point out the differences uh, in between what is classified as a benzodiazepine. Probably not here, but during the le next lecture. So <coughs> can anyone explain the difference between drug abuse and drug misuse? There, there are some situations where your... Um, you're somewhat dependent or, or addicted to a medication, whether that's um, mostly what we categorize as medications that we continue to give to patients, there's usually physical addiction or physical dependence on those medications. So take a pain medication. Take this person that's a, a, a cancer patient that survives every day by taking their morphine extended release, all right? They are addicted to the medication, okay? But if they take it according to what the doctor prescribes in the medication, uh, one tablet twice a day, and they don't overtake that medication, then um, they're taking it correctly, they're not misusing it, and they're definitely not uh, abusing the medication either. Now, where that crosses the line is where they become uh, dependent on it, but also kind of uh, have unintended use of the medication. So they're, they're having their dependence sort of drive this use uh, and abuse of the medication. And that's when uh, this drug abuse comes to be more fruition versus uh, just the misuse of medication. You gave a really good example of uh, a little old lady who uh, misuses her medication, who maybe doesn't uh, take it according to their prescription, 
maybe because she just doesn't uh, remember or just doesn't know. So you got a question in the back or you got an example? Okay, good. So uh, a lot of times the uh, uh, drug abuse involves illicit uh, drugs. Um, and like I said before, this is for the unintentional misuse of either uh, unapproved drugs, prescription drugs, uh, for use outside of what we categorize as a drug, which is the diagnosis, the treatment, or the cure of a disease or condition. All right. So uh, therapeutic range for medications. I, mean, I, I alluded to this a little bit when I was talking about the ibuprofen and that there can be uh, different doses of medications, um, but they still reach a specific therapeutic range. So if I just threw a therapeutic range out there, what would you, what kind of definition would you give me? Needing to counteract the problem or the recommended range in which you would need to treat a specific condition. And those specific medications are medications that we can measure uh, from a specific standpoint for a concentration. So in clinical trials and studies, we knew that a specific range of a medication um, prevented seizures or uh, treated their specific condi condition, okay? Um, in drug research, we call this the ED50. This is the effective dose uh, of 50% of people taking the medication. They became uh, disease-free or they treated their specific condition uh, with this therapeutic range. From drug to drug, it differs, okay? Not all medications can we measure the specific concentration and say, well, this is the effective uh, dose, okay? Some medications like you named before, Depakote, another example would be Phenytoin or Dilantin. These specific medications, uh, we can measure uh, specific concentration and that says that uh, they should be treated for their condition. Now, if patients continue to Cs, these are two examples of seizure medications, then something else is going on and we need to add additional therapy to it. Now, not all those additive therapies have concentrations, uh, but certain ones do. So, a little spin on that, what's the lethal dose of medications? If I said that what's the lethal dose, how would you, how would you know what the lethal dose is? Someone dies as a result of it. So. In clinical trials and development of medications, we measure what's called the LD50. So the lethal dose for 50% of the people who have taken a specific drug um, and that resulted in death. And we're not going to go around and recruit <laughs> people to join a specific study and say, here, here's a big old dose of a medication. We're going to see if this kills you or not, all right? So we've studied this medication in, in lab rats and other animals in a, in a clinical controlled trial setting, okay? And so we have the numbers to say that this is a lethal dose for a specific medication. So how do we do, how do we, how do we use these two examples? The, so the effective dose in one hand, the lethal dose in the other hand, how do we use these for management of patients? We have another term that's called narrow therapeutic range or it's called narrow therapeutic index. So if I said narrow therapeutic range or narrow therapeutic index, what pops in your mind? It's a very fine line. And so um, some specific drugs have a very, very fine line. An example is, uh, is Depakote, or not Depakote, but Digoxin. Digoxin, very therapeutic, narrow therapeutic range, okay? So we're talking about a range of anywhere from 0 0.8 to 1.2 micrograms per ml. That's therapeutic, all right? Once we get up to two, two micrograms per ml, then we start getting toxic. So someone takes maybe two tablets, maybe three tablets. Now we're starting to get into toxic, okay? So when the effective dose is very close to the lethal dose or it's, it's twofold, so the effective dose is twofold and then you start getting into the lethal dose concentration, that's a drug that has a narrow therapeutic range or narrow therapeutic index. Not all medications are like that. Ibuprofen. Ibuprofen's got a huge therapeutic range, all right? The lethal dose is also really, really high. Somebody can take four or five ibuprofen at a time, not have a problem with it at all, okay? Now, some may argue maybe Tylenol is one of those medications that has um, a narrow therapeutic range, okay? 
you start taking five grams, six grams of Tylenol at a time, and it starts to get where your liver is actually becoming damaged for me. Okay? So a couple of different examples of medications that are available over the counter. Tylenol is available over the counter. Ibuprofen is available over the counter. One of those has a neurotherapeutic range. One of them has something that's not a neurotherapeutic range. And digoxin is something that's prescribed uh, by physicians which has a very neurotherapeutic range. Depakote, uh, we talked to, somebody gave an example of Depakote. That's a, a drug that we have uh, that we can actually measure concentrations. Um, that one is not a medication that has a, a neurotherapeutic range or a neurotherapeutic index. There's a huge range in that, okay? Patients can take multiple Depakotes at a time and not become toxic, all right? They can maybe have uh, side effects of the medication that can lead to buildup of ammonia, all right? That's not necessarily a side effect that uh, is uh, toxic and that's going to kill you right away. Does that make sense to everybody? So when I talk about neurotherapeutic range or neurotherapeutic index, it's, it's, it's not so much that every single drug is going to have a neurotherapeutic range. It's only specific drugs that are a little bit more dangerous. And, you know, you shoot for a specific range, and if you shoot too high, then the patient becomes toxic and maybe even leads to death. All right, half-life of medication. What does that mean? In the medical field, uh, um, I talk frequently with physicians, and I, I talk about what's the half-life of medication. We talk about uh, uh, toxicology. We talk about half-life of medication. Well, the half-life of medication is, is basically what it means. It's, it's changing from a concentration from um, half, halfway. So let's take... Let's take Depakote, all right? Depakote has a therapeutic range of 50 to 100, all right? Let's say the patient has a, a concentration of 50. The half-life would be how long it takes from the medication to drop from 50 to 25. So half of it gets eliminated from the body over that period of time. Each specific drug has a different half-life. Some are longer, some are shorter. So a drug with a longer half-life is usually only dosed once a day because it stays in your system for a prolonged period of time. Drugs that have a shorter half-life, they require multiple dose administrations throughout the day or a continuous infusion of the medication, all right, because that medication wears off so quick. A drug with a longer half-life would maybe only need to be dosed via IV once a day, twice a day, and the infusion stops. So what does this mean to you? If we're, if we're looking at effectiveness, um, and uh, if, if you're saying that the medication's already out of their system within one half-life, then um, that effectiveness may drop um, with, with a half-life. So um, aspirin's a really good example. So aspirin um, is a drug that uh, when we give it to a patient with chest pain, we, we look for it specifically, it's antiplatelet effect, okay? So when we give aspirin to a patient who's saying, oh, I'm having this crushing chest pain, um, I can't breathe, I'm nauseated, I'm having this jaw pain also associated with it, we give them aspirin right away. The aspirin in irreversibly inhibits platelets, all right, for the life of the platelet. So that medication is going to last for a really long time. You give aspirin to somebody. So what's the life of a platelet? It's usually around seven days. The body makes more platelets continuously, okay? You take aspirin, 325 is usually the effective dose. It irreversibly inhibits the platelets, and the body has to make more platelets so the platelets can function to form clots, okay? So other drugs that have half-lives, um, if I talked about an IV infusion of a medication, you need to be in... Uh, sort of uh, uh, prone to what does a half-life mean? Well, if I said a half-life of a medication is two minutes, well, you need to be given a continuous infusion of that medication because that medication is going to wear off as soon as you pull out the IV. So if a person uh, is transporting and you're transporting from one facility to the other one, and all of a sudden halfway through your transport you lose IV access and they're running dopamine, well, that medication is going to wear off by the time you get to wherever you're transporting to, okay? Now let's take the flip side. 
Let's take that they're, they're running a, uh, an infusion of vancomycin. All right. They've been at this facility for maybe 24 or 48 hours. All right. They're already on vancomycin antibiotic for infection. All right. You're transporting the IV gets pulled out halfway through the infusion of vancomycin. Do you stop? Do you put it in an IV? Do you wait, wait for the rest of the vancomycin to be infused, or do you just continue on to your next transport? What do you think? What's that? Continue on. Vancomycin is a really long half-life. It's an antibiotic. People only get it once, twice a day. All right. It doesn't matter if they pulled out their IV halfway through the infusion. Okay, that's not going to cause the patient's condition to change at all during the transport. All right. But if you lose IV access for a medication that's that's either increasing their blood pressure, decreasing their blood pressure, causing their heart rate to continue at a specific uh, rate like uh, diltiazem infusion, then you may need to be more cognizant about you know having another IV placed right away, getting that that IV established, and then continuing on with the IV infusion of the medication. All right, and all of this has to do with something I would call half life, which is how long does the medication stay in the body, versus how fast do we metabolize the medication. Okay. Side effects of medications, many medications have side effects associated with it, all right. You'll look it up in your drug reference and you'll see uh, side effects of medication. Now, as we go through drug development, manu specific manufacturers try to minimize the amount of uh, side effects that you have to medications, okay. And new medications are coming out all the time. Most of the time these new medications are, they're better than the ones that were previous out there. They have less side effects. Um, or they do a better job of controlling the specific situation or the treatment for them. Okay? I'm going to take an example. Um, albuterol. Albuterol is something that you're very familiar with. You've been using it for a long, long period of time. It works in the beta receptors in the lungs, cause bronchodilation for patients, treatment for asthma, COPD, um, maybe other shortness of breath for patients. You ever heard of a new medication called Zopinex? Lev albuterol? All right. So the drug companies and the manufacturers developed levalbuterol with a specific intention that it is going to cause the bronchodilation for the patient, but in hopes that you won't get as much tachycardiness from it, all right, and the other cardiac side effects that you get if you give too much albuterol. Now, with the clinical trials and that specific, when they compared albuterol to levalbuterol, they didn't really find a lot of difference. And both of the medications, when you got to a specific range and a specific dose, both of them increased uh, uh, the heart rate and they caused tachycardia in the patients. Okay, So that was maybe uh, uh, a failure on the fact that the drug uh, manufacturer side, uh, they didn't really succeed at decreasing the amount of uh, side effects of the medications. But long, long time ago, uh, when they were treating asthma, you got systemic albuterol. Okay. You got syrup of albuterol. You got tablets of albuterol. They went through and they developed albuterol to be a specific solution, uh, to be in inhalers, meter-dosed inhalers, and to be a nebulized solution. So it specifically gets in the lungs and this specific area, so it causes more bronchodilation without getting a lot of systemic absorption of the medication and causing these jitteriness, the increased heart rate, et cetera. And these are all side effects of the medication. Okay. So when I talk a little bit about uh, pharmacokinetics, I'm talking about um, how medications are um, absorbed in the body, how, they, how they're distributed to different areas in the body, but also how the body takes this medication and metabolizes it and gets it out of the system. Okay? These are all things that have to deal with pharmacokinetics. It's sort of a, a, a big word. The first part of pharmacokinetics is absorption of the medication. All right. But you won't have to deal a lot with this because most of the medication that you're going to be delivering is either uh, via the parenteral route. So when I say uh, parenteral route, what route is that? Anything but GI. So there's 10 different parenteral routes. Okay. There's, there's IV, there's sub-Q, there's IM, there's sublingual, uh, there's interosseous, ET tube, intranasal tube. Um, all these things are, are considered 
um, uh, parenteral, which is without the GI tract. All right. So absorption of medication is pretty much only via the, the enteral route. Okay. So when I say um, if you give aspirin, 325, but only uh, maybe half of that gets absorbed in your system, um, that's how much the absorption is via the, um, uh, the enteral route. Okay. But primarily, when you're giving a medication via the parenteral route, 100% of the medication gets absorbed. So you see different um, dosing recommendations based off of the route that you're giving them. Okay. Like I said before, parenteral routes, there's 10 different parenteral routes for a medication to be uh, delivered. Most of these things that you're going to be delivering um, is mostly via the IV route. You'll have some other things. If you, if you lose IV access in a code situation, you may be giving medication via the, um, the intraosseous device. Older term, uh, older way of delivering medication is via the ET tube. Um, this is kind of passed away and other effective uh, routes of medications are, are better for absorption wise. <clears throat> so when you're delivering a medication to a patient, um, there's different, um, we call it, talk about pharmacokinetics, there's differences on these uh, different ways that you would deliver them. So if you're giving an, uh, an IV infusion of a medication, uh, the chance of it reaching a therapeutic window or a therapeutic state can take a lot longer for a medication. So you'll see a lot of times if you're giving a, a, a quick cardiac med or medication that you need to get into the system really quick, you'll see that they give boluses of medication followed by maybe a continuous infusion of a medication. If you start a continuous infusion of a medication, it takes longer for that medication to get to a specific therapeutic window and to get the effects of the medication itself. Okay. So when I'm talking about absorption of medication, the absorption of medication is mostly related to the, uh, the enteral route. Now these graphs kind of specifically say the parenteral route. So you're giving boluses of medication. You really can't give a bolus of medication orally. Uh, most of those boluses are given via IV. Does this make sense to everybody? Any questions at all about that? Now all these things kind of play into um, a part and all these things will be coming together. If you give a bolus of medication and the medication has a very long half-life, all right, you can get by with just giving the boluses of the medication. Now if the medication has a very short half-life, you not only have to give a bolus of the medication, but you have to give a continuous infusion of the medication to follow, okay? So, if you're in a code situation and uh, the patient was having uh, V-fib and you said, well, wait a minute, um, I looked up in my, my reference and I need to be giving a continuous infusion of amiodarone. Well, that's great. You looked at your, your drug reference and it said a continuous infusion of amiodarone. That's not wrong, okay, because you probably should be giving it, you know, an antiarrhythmic during that situation. But the chance of it actually getting to the beta therapeutic window will be like hours before that happens. All right? So you need to sort of mix it up and you need to give a bolus of the medication right away. But because the bolus wears off relatively quickly, you not only need to give the bolus of the medication, but you need to start a continuous drip of the medication also to follow. All right? Drugs that have a really long half life, like digoxin. Dijoxin, all you have to worry about is just giving that initial bolus and that medication stays in your system for a really, really long period of time. Any questions at all about any medication? You want to give me an example of medication that you don't know what the half-life is and I can tell you what it is? Diltiazem. Diltiazem wears off pretty quickly. All right. After you give a bolus of the medication, uh, usually within about 15, 20 minutes, sometimes 45 minutes later, that heart rate is going to kick right back up. Okay. Now the reason why a lot of patients will only take diltiazem capsules or tablets once a day is because the, um, the drug manufacturers they have actually formulated an extended release formulation of the medication. So um, if you take apart the capsules, you'll see all these little beads in there. All the little beads absorb and dissolve at different points in time. 
so you get a continuous release of the medication so the medication never wears off. Usually represented as time, yep. And, and in, the, in the time part can be all differences. So drugs that have a really long half-life may have a half-life in days, all right? Now drugs that have a really short half-life may either have seconds or minutes. Adenosine. Adenosine is a drug that I'm sure most of your uh, rigs have it or carry it. Adenosine, really short half-life. You're talking minutes, all right? I don't know if you've ever heard of this medication being advertised, but a uh, medication called Fosamax. It's for um, um, osteoporosis. Really long half-life, okay? This medication, Fosamax, actually gets deposited in your bones. Your bones don't turn over very much, all right? Your bones pretty much stay solid. It's your, or your skeleton, makes up your body. So that drug actually has days um, that uh, the half-life is. So bioavailability, um, I've already talked a little bit about this and I've given the example of aspirin, but that's the differences in between how much medication that you actually take versus how much medication actually reaches your bloodstream. So the bioavailability isn't all that different between a medication that you're giving IV, because pretty much all that medication is going to get right into your IV bloodstream right away. All right? But if you take a pill, some of that medication may not break down, may not get absorbed, some of it just passes right through your system and goes out in your stool. Um, aspirin is a, one example that um, if you maybe if you take 325 milligrams of aspirin, maybe only 150 of that 150 milligrams of aspirin is absorbed in your system. So that's less than 50% bioavailable for you. Okay, so that's the differences in how much you take versus how much you get absorbed in your system, specific system. So elimination, how are drugs eliminated from the body? Kidneys is one example, all right? How else are drugs eliminated from the body? Liver. Liver. There's two main organs that, that metabolize and excrete a lot of the drugs that we, we put in our body. So the liver metabolizes drugs through this, you'll hear about it, cytochrome P450. So write it down, this is, this is something you, you'll see in your drug reference. Uh, CYP, that stands for, that's abbreviation for cytochrome, and P450. So there's a bunch of isoenzymes that make up our liver and that metabolize drugs, okay? Um, you'll hear some of them specifically categorized out into the cytochrome P453A4, some are 2D6. Um, they all have a specific name associated with them and uh, a subtype that says, that this specific subtype metabolizes this specific medication. Now, if it's a medication that's metabolized via the liver, it also has to be excreted from our body. So most of the time it's metabolized into a water-soluble form. The liver takes this water, or I'm sorry, the kidney takes this water-soluble form and excretes it via our urine. Not all medications need to be metabolized by the liver to be eliminated from our system, okay? Vancomycin. I gave this example before, antibiotic, really long half-life, okay? Vancomycin does not get metabolized via the, via the liver, but it gets excreted via the kidneys, okay? So the half-life of the medication is dependent on how well our kidneys actually function. I'm throwing a lot of terms at you right now, all right? So what does the half-life mean again? loses half its effectiveness, okay? So the longer a half-life is, the more it stays into our body though too, okay? The concentration stays high enough, all right? So a drug like vancomycin, antibiotic, you don't metabolize it via the liver, okay? It gets excreted 100% via our kidneys. The half-life is long in patients that have um, either no renal function or really bad renal function. So. A dialysis patient who has pretty much no renal function, okay, or very little, they only get vancomycin three times a week. The drug stays in there and stays at a high enough concentration for a long enough period of time that they don't need to get the medication as often. If I went into the hospital, I'd probably need to get vancomycin every, and, and the rest of you in here would need to get vancomycin twice a day, 
okay? As we age, our kidney functions kind of slowly deteriorate. So our older population pretty much only gets vancomycin like once a day. Okay? Does that make sense to everybody? Elimination? All right. So allergic reactions, I'm just going to briefly talk about this. Allergic reactions can be subtypes into four different types. So there can be anywhere from uh, type 1, 2, 3, or 4 types of allergic reactions. Um, it's important for you to recognize what is an allergic reaction, but also maybe recognize uh, what you need to do in the event of an allergic reaction to a, a specific medication. So allergic reactions don't always develop after the first time of being exposed to medication. All right? It's the repetitive exposure to a foreign body in the, bo in the system that the body actually makes um, uh, antibodies, which attacks these, uh, what the body recognizes as antigens floating around in its system. So the longer medication is on board for a patient, the more exposure that a patient has to specific medication, the more chances of a patient actually developing these antibody antigen reactions and having these allergic reactions to the medications. So a very well tolerated allergic reaction would be just a simple rash, right? Um, something that would be an emergency allergic reaction would be swelling of the throat, difficulty breathing, compromised airway, okay? Two very different allergic reactions, not side effects to medications, all right? But allergic reactions, these are, these are things that the body actually mounts antibodies to different antigens floating around in its bloodstream. Is all clear? Okay. All right. First drug, you can cross it off the list. All right. Zygris. Has anyone ever heard of Zygris? So Zygris had its day back in, um, I think it first came around back in 2004. 2003. It was used primarily in the ICU setting and critical care settings. Um, it was used for patients who qualified uh, and had severe sepsis, really sick patients. Sick patients that had um, uh, different organ failures, all right? So we're talking about kidneys failing, liver failing. Uh, the body would shunt off the blood flow to these specific organs. Um, in the ICU settings, they would give them a drug called Zygris or Drochicogen alpha. These are continuous infusions of medications. Um, and after the, um, Eli Lilly was the, the drug company that actually brought this medication to market. They studied in multiple patients, multiple clinical trials. The drug was out from, like I said, from 2003, 2004, all the way to 2011. All right. After 2011, the FDA started to look at specific uses of the medication and they did a review on the medication and found out that it actually wasn't benefiting these patients, but it was maybe even harming them, okay? These patients who were on this drug called Drochicogen Alpha or Zygris, they had a lot of bleeding issues, all right? The drug itself was an activated protein C. It was an anticoagulant, basically, that they were giving to these patients, all right? So even though the drug was approved, was on the market, was out there, patients were getting it, the FDA did a review on the medication and found out that it was actually harmful to patients and it was taken off the market. All right. So you won't see this drug anymore. It's completely off the market. You can cross it off your list. This is just an example, and I wanted to just bring this to the light, that drugs get approved every day, and after post-approval analysis of these medications, uh, these medications were, were taken off the market because the safety and the efficacy just wasn't there in this particular drug. Antiemetics, um, I'll cover these a little bit real quickly. Promethazine, is anyone familiar with promethazine? All right. Promethazine, um, if you look at its pharmacological uh, action itself, it's more of an antihistamine. All right. You'll see it paired with codeine and syrup, promethazine with codeine and syrup, um, antihistamine. The codeine is the antitussive effect. Um, promethazine is actually very good for nausea and vomiting for patients. Side effect is it causes a lot of uh, CNS depression. Patients can get really drowsy from it. 
Um, the thing that I want you to bring out or bring away from this lecture is that you need to give it in a large vein or via Z track. So basically, um, it's kind of like a, um, if this is like the deltoid muscle right here, you'll go in, you kind of pull the tissue, let the tissue relax, and then you go in the rest of the way. So it's not like you're actually bending the needle itself, but you're, you're preventing this, this one track out of the medication. And this specific medication is very toxic to the tissue around it. So if the tissue actually leaks out of the muscle and it gets with the, uh, the subcutaneous tissue and the, uh, the dermis itself, it actually can cause really bad necrosis of the tissue. So, and the reason why I say that you have to give it in a, in a large IV vein is also because you don't want that, uh, that medication sort of leaking out of that vein. The fancy word for leaking out of the vein is called extravasation. All right. So you want a very well-established, well-flowing IV before you actually administer the medication because of this uh, necrosis. Other things to watch for if you're going to be giving promethazine is it can prolong QT and QT interval. Compazine is very familiar, it's very similar to that. Another name for compazine, the generic name is prochlorperazine. Okay. Um, this structure is very similar to antipsychotics. Um, it can have a lot of antipsychotic uh, side effects on the medication. One specific one is um, extra pyramidal symptoms. Does anyone know what extra pyramidal symptoms are? If you look at it in reference, you'll see it referred to as EPS. E for extra, pre for pyramidal, and S for symptoms. So these are also symptoms that you would find with patients who are taking a lot of like high doses of antipsychotics or maybe they just got increased on their antipsychotic dose and they get, um, there's, there's a list of them, so they get dystonic or dystonic, so they get muscle rigidity, all right. You can get this pseudo Parkinsonism, so they almost have like a Parkinson's kind of movement, they're having shaking, they're having difficulty with walking. They can also have something that's called akathisia. So akathisia is this, uh, this overwhelming feeling of anxiety that I want to get the hell out of here <laughs> after you just gave me this medication. So you need to monitor for that because if you're going to be giving prochlorperazine, all right, or if they just gave prochlorperazine prior to you transporting the patient from one facility to the other one, and all of a sudden the patient's like, I'm ripping my IV out and I'm going out the back door, and there's nothing you can do to stop me, okay? They're not having an allergic reaction to the medication, all right? So don't get this confused. They're having a side effect of the medication, and that's the extra parental side effect, okay? Other things to watch for with promethazine, prochlorperazine, watch the prolonged QT interval. So any other cardiac medications, all right? Make sure you have them on a monitor, and make sure you're monitoring for those patients. Now, halfway through their lecture, we talked about drug manufacturers coming up with specific drugs that were safer, had less side effects than the medications, but were equally as effective. All right? That's this whole benefit of having all these new drugs on the market. Zofran is one of these, one of these new drugs on the market. All right? But Zofran has actually been around for a long enough time that it's actually generic now. All right? It's been on the market for longer than... I'd say probably 10 years or so, okay? So the specific drug manufacturer that develops Zofran gets a patent on the drug for a number of years, X amount of years, all right? The, now, they get a patent on the medication because they did all the clinical research, they did all the trials, they did all the development for the medication itself. After those 10 years of, of, of or, or 15 years, however long the patent lasts, they've reaped their profits, all right? They've now um, hopefully got back all the money that they put into the development of the drug. Now the drug's generic. So Zofran is one of those medications. doesn't have a lot of prolonged QT interval with it. has a little bit. It's dose dependent. The more you give, the more you, the more you get. Okay? You're not going to have as much sedation from it either. Okay? But it is very beneficial and it, is, it actually works pretty good against nausea and vomiting. Okay? 
Other new medications I'm going to be talking about today, H2 blockers. I talked about about halfway through, I gave the example of Pepsid being available over the counter. Um, other things that you can get over the counter, you can actually get Zantac. You can actually get Tagamet. All these medications are available over the counter. Most institutions um, have Pepsid. Pepsid, you can get over the counter as a tablet. You can get as a liquid. You can get as an IV formulation of the medication too. All right. Now, the Pepsin and Zantac rarely interact with other medications. Tagamet or Cimetidine actually does. So Tagamet is a medication that's metabolized via our liver. All right. And the problem with Tagamet is it actually inhibits some of the isoenzymes that are responsible for metabolism of other drugs. That's terrible. So now you have a drug that has normally a half-life, I'm throwing a lot of these terms out there, I want you to get used to them, a half-life of 12 hours. But wait a minute, the patient started taking Tagamet. Now the medication's not going to be metabolized as fast, and maybe their half-life changes from 12 hours to 24 hours. So the medication builds in their system, and they maybe get toxic with it. So Tagamet, it's kind of a dirty drug. It's not used anymore, uh, especially in the institutions. It's still available over the counter. Um, I tell patients not to take it. I tell them to either go for Pepsid or Zantac. Either one of those are uh, less problems with metabolism and less problems with drug interactions. All right, enough of me talking. Now I want to get some answers from you. All right, so tell me, I'm gonna, I got a case here of uh, NV, 49-year-old male with a newly diagnosed stable dissecting aortic aneurysm, hypertensive emergency. He is stable on esmolol drip and being transferred from Oconomowoc Memorial Hospital to Waukesha Memorial Hospital for surgical intervention. When you pick the patient up, the nurse tells you that the medication, and why take medication, I'm saying esmolol, is running at 150 mics per kg per minute. And the titration is by 50 mics per kg per minute every 10 minutes to a MAP, which is mean arterial pressure, of 70. You are told the drug has a short half-life, about nine minutes. Is it safe to turn off the pump and transfer the patient to a Waukesha Memorial Hospital without running the medication? I see some heads shaking. Nope, it's not safe. Why is the medication not safe? Half-life, right, right, right. Half-life is only nine minutes. Can't make it from Economy Walk to Waukesha in nine minutes, can you? Now, if I give you another example, if I said the medication that I was running was vancomycin, what do you think? Can you turn it off? Can you run? It's got a long half-life. Sure you can. So the answer is false. You can't run without running. Another case study. Right before you get ready to transfer the patient from the hospital bed uh, to the striker, uh, the patient yells out, I feel sick, I think I'm going to throw up. The nurse runs to get some Compazine, Procolorperazine IV. The medication is given IV and the patient is transported to Waukesha Memorial Hospital. Shortly after leaving Conomwalk Memorial Hospital, the patient states that his neck is getting really stiff and the rest of his muscles are becoming rigid. What should you do to help this patient? You want Benadryl? And why do you get Benadryl? Is it an allergic reaction? EPS. Right, good, good. All right, different patient. MC, 65 year old patient with cellulitis, being tra treated for vancomycin. Patient's level come back with a peak concentration of 20 micrograms per ml, and this level came back at 8 p.m. The trough the next day at 8 a.m was five micrograms. What is the half-life of vancomycin? So the half-life is the time it takes to get to half the concentrations. So at 8 p.m., the concentration was 20. Six hours later, the concentration will be 10. Six hours later, the concentration will be five, okay? And that just so happens to be 12 hours, two half-lives. And that's the time from 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. Six hours is the half-life. I'll let that one sink in a little bit, okay? 
That's all I have for today.